are so fortunate and thrilled um, to be here for Dance Health, Doctors for Dancers. Welcome. Welcome, Hi, everyone. Dr. J. Dr. Hi. J. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me okay or do you want me to put in headphones? Headphones I think would be good. And like Jerry was saying, this is a class that as an intersection of studio owners, parents, educators, possibly some dancers, it's going to be a lot of us. So everyone's coming from a different background and a different experience. All questions are valid. We ask that you just use respectful language um, if you ask a question in the chat. We'll definitely, uh, we see you, we hear you, we give voice to that. Um, this is a safe space to share. Obviously, I know we'll be talking about some vulnerable stuff because folks uh, going through medical issues, that can be vulnerable. If you would like me to stop recording at any time, just go ahead and raise your hand or say, please stop recording. I'd like to talk about something and I'm happy to do that. Um, so that way everyone feels empowered to ask the questions that they need without knowing it's going to wind up on YouTube, you know? All right, so, uh, Dr. J, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me, guys. Glad to be here. Okay, so um, if you're all all right with it, I'm going to get started. I have a couple of slides that I wanted to go through first, and then you guys can ask me as many questions as you please. Um, if somebody's monitoring the chats, then that's helpful for answering questions, okay? And I'm just going to share my screen right now. Yes, and I'll be monitoring the chat. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's get that pulled up. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Good. Okay, just going to hide that. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna get going. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Julia Iafredi. I go by Dr. J because my last name's very weird. Um, I'm a sports medicine and dance medicine physician here in New York City, and I work at Columbia University Medical Center. Um, some information about me: I'm the director of dance medicine here at Columbia, and I am also a team physician for the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Team. And I've recently been named to the New York Times uh, 2019 and 2020 Super Doctors Rising Star Edition. So I'm very proud of that. And I happen to be an ex-competitive dancer with board certifications um, in physical medicine and rehabilitation and also in um, sports medicine. Okay, so the idea here is um, why, why are dancers so important to be taken care of? And why do you deserve to be, you know, seen as athletes? Because you are athletes, right? So I call my dancers artistic athletes. Um, you have an aesthetic component to you, but you also have a lot of technique that's important. You go through these extreme ranges of motion. You have, um, you know, a mentality that's kind of a mental fortitude, the strength of keeping pushing yourself. Uh, the environment that you uh, have to dance in can be different. Um, and yet we don't really do screening for you. We don't do pre-participation exams for dancers, which is really frustrating. Um, and it also, I think, leads to some um, issues with access to care. So there's a lot of mistrust um, with dancers and the medical community. And I think it's because, um, at least when I was dancing, I felt like my doctor didn't understand me. You didn't get what I was going through. You didn't understand that, yeah, I know I'm flexible, but it doesn't feel right. Um, and there was some mistrust. You always thought, oh, they're just going to make me stay out of work or stay out of dancing. Um, and then insurance is always an issue after you get off your parents' insurance, at least. Um, so a lot of the professional dancers have issues with insurance um, and getting to see you know, great specialists that might not take their insurance. So. Um, Dancers as athletes. So there is actually minimal data on the demands of dance training and performance on the cardiovascular system, so your heart, um, and the musculoskeletal system, so your muscles and bones and stuff. Um, the heart rate data that we do have shows that elite ballet dancers are at or near their maximum heart rates during performances. Makes sense. Um, but strength and power data on dancers is mixed. There's a lot of dance styles and efforts are not as prolonged or sustained as in some other sports. So you work really hard for three minutes for a performance, but then that's it. Um, whereas a football player might be on the field or um, 
a uh, soccer player might be on the field for 20, 30, 40 minutes at a time. There's also different dance styles, which equates to different dance injuries. So there's different technical requirements for all of them, which um, also requires different physical prerequisites, uh, different training models. There's uh, shoes versus being barefoot. So we typically see that modern dancers average about two injuries per year and ballet dancers average about three injuries per, per year. Unfortunately, there's not any data on hip hop dancers. So um, I myself am an ex hip hop dancer and so it's a big passion of mine. And yet there's very little data on injuries in hip hop dancers. So the other thing is a dancer's challenge. So you go through a lot as a dancer. Um, growth spurts is a big deal. So for my younger dancers, um, your muscles, don't move as fast as your bones do when you're growing initially. So think about your bone growing, okay? The muscles that are attaching on either side of the bone can't keep up. So they get pulled, 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 and they, you experience this decrease in your flexibility and your strength and your coordination and your technical control. And that usually happens, at least for uh, girls, around ages 11 to 14. And it can last up to two years. So it's very frustrating and it leads to this decreased confidence, um, frustration and depression in a lot of the dancers. And so I want you to know that that's normal. You're supposed to go through that, but it is going to make you feel like you're not as good as you were two years ago. And that's why. So you will get that flexibility back, I promise. The other thing is overuse injuries. So like I said, a lot of dancers have some mistrust with the medical community and I think it's just you don't feel understood. Um, and so what ends up happening are these little injuries that you get, these little annoyances just build and build and build on each other and become this humongous issue down the road. And that's a problem for everyone. Lastly, there's a lot of medical issues that dancers deal with. So weight, nutrition, disordered eating, smoking, um, menstrual dysfunction, uh, which means irregular periods. Uh, bone health issues, psychological stress, and a high prevalence of what's called the female athlete triad, which I'll expand on a little bit down the road here. In terms of injuries that occur in dance, they're pretty similar to other athletes. They include both overuse and acute injuries. And uh, this number is staggering to me. 82 to 85% of professional dancers will have at least one injury per year. That's awful. That should not, we should not be aiming for that. We need to get that down. So up to 90% of them will need some form of treatment and up to 84% will continue to perform despite the injury. And we know of a lot of professional dancers that have done this. Dancers, unlike their athletic uh, or other athlete counterparts, tend to seek care from instructors, massage therapists, chiropractors, and other non-traditional practitioners as opposed to physicians um, as well, which is fine. But the problem is a lot of times you don't have that initial diagnosis from a physician. And so you're treating maybe, you're treating the symptoms, but not the problem. You're treating what's coming from the problem. Professional dancers miss between 18 to 21 days per year due to injury, which is a substantial amount. So why do you get injured? Well, you're exposed to a wide range of risk factors for injury. So the most common uh, issues are types of dance and frequency of your classes, your rehearsals, um, your performances, the duration of training, environmental conditions like having hard floors or really cold studios, um, which I think has been an issue for a lot of people that have been dancing at home since they couldn't go to the studios, right? Um, equipment used or shoes, uh, body alignment issues, prior history of injury, and then nutritional def deficits. So this picture makes me cringe every time I look at it. <laughs> um, risk of injury. So the prevalence rate for injuries is around 13.4 to 37.5%. And this increases with training volume. If you remember nothing else from this lecture, please remember this. If you exceed, go more than 16 hours of total sport participation, regardless of the number of sports, that includes dance. So no matter how many different styles of dance you're doing, if you are dancing more than 16 hours per week, that carries an increase, the greatest risk of injury out of anything, okay? There's a lot of technical demands with dance too. Extreme range of motion like this poor little girl in the picture. Fine motor control. Um, and it can expose you to higher risk of injury because you are expected to put your body past what's anatomically normal 
And so you're asking your muscles to hold a hip into a joint that's not stable enough. However, there's little research that can be directly extrapolated into dance medicine, medicine from the sports medicine literature right now. So lots of dance injury types, you guys probably know, uh, most of them occur in the lower extremity. Um, about a third of them are in the foot and ankle, a third of them are in the knee, and a third of them are miscellaneous. So stress fractures, IT band, uh, tendinopathy, and low back pain. The only other caveat there is that um, in males, the highest injury is in uh, low back from lifts, and then ankles from leaps. And in um, my break dancers, I will see a lot of neck injuries, which usually most dancers don't have neck injuries otherwise. So I want you to be able to understand the different types of injuries. That way, when you do get injured and your doctor or your therapist or whoever explains to you what you have going on, you can con comprehend what that means. And you can also share that information with your dance teacher, with your future therapist, etc. So a sprain is a stretch or tear of a ligament, okay? So when you say I twisted my ankle, you sprained your ankle, okay? On the other hand, a strain, which is um, an acute injury to a muscle, okay? So sprain with a P is for ligaments, strain with a T is for muscle injuries. So when you pull a hamstring, that's a strain, that's a muscle strain. Tendinitis versus tendinosis. So I see these things in my practice a lot, and I do a lot of surgeries on tendon tendon problems. But so itis, tendonitis is acute. It's an acute trauma to the tendon and the tendon attaches the muscle to the bone and it's inflammatory. That's why things like uh, NSAIDs like uh, ibuprofen and ice seem to make it feel better. Okay. But tendinosis is chronic. It's a scarring of these chronic little tiny injuries that you get to the tendon that don't heal up properly. And so it's not actually an inflammation anymore. So people that take ibuprofen for you know, a chronic tendonitis that they've had for a year, that's not appropriate because it's not an inflammatory process anymore. And so all you're doing is limiting your healing by decreasing the inflammation. Inflammation helps us heal. It's only when we have too much inflammation that it's a problem. Nerve entrapments are pinched nerves that happen between kind of muscle layers or fascial planes. Fascia is just the sausage casing around each muscle. It usually involves burning, tingling, numbness kind of feelings. You might get that when you have shoes that are too tight and it can put pressure on the top of your foot and you might get some numbness in your toes. Fractures are bone breaks. They can be complete or incomplete. So if you fracture your tibia or leg bone, and stress fractures are repetitive stress injuries on the bone that cause it to weakness or cause it to weaken, excuse me, in a certain area. And those can actually lead to fractures if they're not addressed. And so this actually happened to Misty Copeland in like 2018, I think it was, or 17. She had this ongoing stress fracture that was just repetitive injury over repetitive injury. And finally, she injured it so bad that she had to have a plate and screws put in. Um, and so that's a, that's a massive injury, and that could, have been, that could have been the end of her dancing career. So they can't go unnoticed. And then concussion, I'm going to use the term mild, but it's, it's honestly not mild. It's still a form of traumatic brain injury. It's just, you know, you're, you usually go back to normal afterwards. But it is a hard hit to your head that kind of jostles your brain and causes you to have kind of some mental brain fog. And if you get a concussion, you are not with it enough to be able to pay attention during dance. So you shouldn't be dancing if you have a concussion. Okay, this is just some information that shows risk factors for musculoskeletal injuries in pre-professional dancers. So there are systemic reviews. There are these big reviews from multiple systems. But a lot of that, what I was just talking to you about is listed here. Um, so these are important things. And um, I'm gonna let Jerry keep this slide so that you guys can have this um, lecture so you can look through all this on your own too. Um, timing is important too. So in most sports, in most sports, risk of injury is actually higher in competition than in training. But in dance, it's the opposite. So you train at really high levels for a really long time for a relatively short competition, right? Your performance is usually only about three minutes, let's say. So, so if you are practicing, practicing, practicing over and over and again, that's when you're going to get most of your injuries. Um, also, the level of specialized participation may involve higher level competition at younger ages. So that means 
that dancers tend to hit that pre-professional or near professional status way earlier than other athletes do. Dancers and gymnasts, I'd say, both are at the almost professional level by the time they're like 13, 14, whereas that's unheard of in football and soccer. There's no 14-year-old boy going to the NFL tomorrow, you know? But there might be a 14-year-old girl who's going to be dancing with, you know, dancing the Nutcracker or something with um, a ballet. So keep that in mind, too. And then consider scheduled rest periods. So um, this little figure down here is actually kind of helpful because it shows that as a dancer, you might get this repetitive minor trauma, but if you get it addressed with your symptoms and get a diagnosis, we can rehab you properly and get you back into the dance. But if you kind of just keep pushing it away, keep pushing it away and ignoring it, you don't get a diagnosis. It continues to the point of major trauma. And then we get to this point where you have a lot more to do and a very slow return to competition. So get it dealt with early so that it doesn't become a problem. Nutrition is important for dancers. There is a lot of pressures to remain thin in uh, dance, especially in ballet. That, there is some change there, right? That is, we are seeing a change, but it's still there. But that pressure to remain thin can lead to um, poor eating, poor nutritional status, and increased risk of stress fractures and poor muscular strength. So this is part of that female athlete triad. And that's what this little picture is down below. So basically having low energy availability with or without an eating disorder, so anorexia, bulimia, anything like that, you can get basically functional amenorrhea, which means you lose your periods or they become far less frequent. And I know that sounds like a good thing, but it's not. Um, and then that can actually lead to osteoporosis, brittle bones. That's like your grandma and your great grandma. That's what they have. So if you get that when you're 20, that's a problem because we can't make that go away. I can't reverse osteoporosis. So we have to fix this. And just taking a birth control pill to normalize your period doesn't fix it. Okay, so better access. We need sports nutritionists that, or dance nutritionists that understand what it is you're doing and how much energy you're expelling. And then education regarding caloric intake. This is a article that was just um, published in Dance Magazine by Garnet Henderson, and she interviewed me for it to talk about what would it take to change ballet's aesthetic um, of this extreme thinness. And I kind of made the point that it's it's an aesthetic preference, but not a prerequisite for good technique, right? So there's no scientific evidence that says you have to be skinny to be good at ballet. It's just a traditional thing. It's this body aesthetic that we seem to like, but it has nothing to do with your biomechanics. I mean, James Whiteside's a perfect example of it. We've seen him on point. I don't know if anybody follows his Instagram, but on, he's on point all the freaking time. And he's a six foot tall muscular guy. So he clearly weighs more than all of us probably, and he can get on point. So why does a girl have to be so skinny to do it, okay? Another myth is that you have to be skinny to be lifted. It's actually better if you have good muscle mass to be lifted because you can actually help lift yourself, okay? So that's actually important stuff. So, so a lot of this is old school mentality, mainly from like, you know, the way things were a long time ago. Okay, so nutrition, obviously your body needs fuel and you should have a well-balanced meal, okay? So that's the most important thing. But there are some supplements that may help some people. I don't expect you to be taking all of these. In fact, most of these will just give you expensive urine if you are eating well, okay? But for some people that are vegetarians or pescatarians or don't get certain things in their diet because they're really picky eaters, these are some of the better supplements um, for uh, people like you. So vitamin D. Vitamin D is a hormone. We get it from the sun usually. So the people that are low in vitamin D are typically people that live in the Northern Hemisphere and don't get a lot of sun exposure. So for example, in New York in the winter. Um, and people that are stuck inside for long periods of time, i.e. COVID. So all of us right now. And then also people that have darker skin. So the more melanin you have in your skin, the more of a barrier you have from the sun's rays. That's why you don't see as many uh, skin burns on people that are more tan than on people that are whiter. And so that melanin um, blocks the sun's rays, but the sun is what's uh, carrying that vitamin D into your skin. And so you're blocking out that vitamin D. And so supplementing yourself with vitamin D is not a bad idea if you are one of those people. Uh, vitamin D3 is the best kind of vitamin D to take. Um, um, 
quercetin is a uh, flavonoid, so it's, um, it comes from plants, and it's important for um, mast cell stabilization and immune system function. And so you can find that in onions, green tea, uh, berries, and apples, okay? Uh, vitamin C, chances are you don't need more of this. It's found in most fruits, most citrus. And unless you're a pirate, uh, you probably get enough fruits and veggies in your diet. So you probably don't need vitamin C. And really high doses of vitamin C can actually be dangerous. So a lot of these um, vitamins and nutrients, we can actually test um, for. So we can get labs on you, draw labs, and make sure that you have adequate levels of them. And then the things you don't have adequate levels of, those are the things we should think about supplementing if you can't get it in your regular food. Um, zinc is a mineral. It's found in red meat, but it's also found in poultry. So people that are like, I don't like eating red meat. Well, okay, your chicken will have it too. It's also in beans, nuts, seafood, whole grains, and fortified breakfast cereals. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble micronutrient, and it's important for your vision. Uh, curcumin and turmeric. So curcumin is a component of turmeric. Turmeric is a spice and it, it has uh, anti-inflammatory properties. So that's something that's okay to take for anti-inflammation, especially if you have like a little acute injury. Instead of taking ibuprofen, you could try taking turmeric. Uh, glutathione is a antioxidant and we find it a lot in green tea, but it's also in a lot of those green leafy vegetables. Um, uh, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, uh, kale, avocados, broccoli, um, cucumbers. So glutathione, basically anything green. Um, you eat them raw or mildly steamed. If you cook them for too long, you lose a lot of the benefits. And then the other important point I wanted to make is there is no supplement that has proven effectiveness against COVID-19. So none of this stuff is going to fix your chances from getting COVID, but it can help boost some of your immune system if you need it. Big if. Okay, so let's talk about pain. You are pretty much guaranteed to get pain as a dancer during your career, okay? It's just important to be able to recognize between the good pain and the bad pain. The good pain is muscle burning during activity, body aches following an intense workout, and it usually resolves in about 24 hours. The bad pain, on the other hand, burning, tingling, numbness, aching that just goes on forever, stinging, if it lasts significantly longer than 24 hours and returns with increased activity, we might want to be a little worried. And if it keeps being consistent over multiple weeks, again, we should be a little worried, okay? Pain tolerance. Um, so this is a really interesting issue with dancers. So um, you get high pain thresholds early in your dance career, okay? But it leads dancers to push through injuries a lot. And so it comes to the point where their bodies become oversensitized to trauma. And so once those bodies become oversensitized, the dancers then experience a decrease in their pain threshold. And it, um, they can't push through anymore. They can't tolerate it. And so having an understanding of this difference between the pain experience and your pain tolerance and how they interact together is really important to protect your career and how long of a career you can have as a dancer. The other important thing to talk about is access to care. So um, underserved populations, uninsured or underinsured, lack of provider knowledge. So if people like me don't understand what you do, that's a problem. Lack of dancer or instructor knowledge. So if people like you don't understand what's going on with your body, that's also a problem. Fear of possible implications and not enough research, okay? So there's a couple different prevention uh, ideas that we have, mainly like in school, Athletes get pre-participation medical examinations to make sure that there's low risk for injury for them. Why are we not doing it for dancers? Why don't we have that happen? At the professional level, it happens, but by then it's usually too late. Okay, we need it to happen when you're 10, 11, 12, 13. So preseason conditioning, functional performance testing, identifying those risk factors, those are the things that are going to stop you from getting injured in the first place. It makes my job easier. It makes your life better. Okay, and then burnout syndrome. So unfortunately, psychological stress plays a large part in injury and uh, burnout. There's a lot of pressure from parents. Dance Moms has taught us that, right? Coaches and instructors have high expectation of a lot of their dancers. 
And so it can cause perfectionism in a lot of the dancers and that stresses some people out and can cause some poor mental health issues. It also is part of your identity, right? Dancing is part of your identity. It has always been part of mine. And so I think the loss of being able to dance, having that camaraderie over these last couple of months has really led to some poor mental health in some people. So we need to come up with methods of coping with that stress. Okay, you knew I was gonna touch on this, COVID. <laughs> COVID is still there. COVID still exists. We have to be careful, okay? But we can probably return to dance. So as they mentioned, I work with a group called Doctors for Dancers. We're a bunch of medical specialists, not only doctors, but also therapists, um, uh, counselors, et cetera, that um, kind of specifically like to work with dancers. And so we did a presentation um, back in uh, earlier in July about mask use in the studio, how to keep yourself safe. Um, that little YouTube post is the uh, link to it uh, if you wanna watch the first one. We're doing another one on Thursday, August 13th. It's an awesome opportunity for you to get a bunch of information from a bunch of specialists. I'll be speaking, same with Dr. Bluestein and Dr. Meyer, and then uh, Terry Hyde, the, last, the gentleman right there. He's actually a, a counselor for dancers, so he talks about mental health a lot. So he's great, and it's just a way to kind of help arm you with knowledge so that you know what the recommendations are and you can make good smart choices for yourself. So I hope you guys will join us for that because it's a really good experience. Um, mental health. So uh, we've been talking a lot about ethnicity and inclusivity very recently. It's always been an issue in dance just like it's been an issue in the world. But for the people that feel underrepresented in dance, how do you feel seen and heard? How do you feel seen and heard without making a bunch of noise and feeling like you're trying to, you know, over expand what you need? And then for those that don't feel ethnically um, excluded, how do you be an ally for those people, especially when you're trying to dance via Zoom? Um, coping with loss of control. So dealing with this whole concept of, you know, this brave new world, we're not exactly sure what's happening. We're not exactly sure how long this is going to go on for. So what do we do with that? Uh, dealing with Zoom fatigue, so how to maintain your love for dance while dealing with, you know, this unfortunate uh, inability to talk to people face to face. And then the whole concept of social distancing, right? So changing the way the stage is going to look. Um, sleep directly impacts your immunity. Stress also directly impacts it. If you have high stress, you have high cortisol levels. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It actually decreases the strength of your immune system, which makes you more at risk for illness. So finding a balance in your life is important. You're not gonna be able to do everything. We just need to keep you reasonably healthy, reasonably humble, reasonably happy, so that we can kind of move forward together. Per the CDC, so the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, it's a great organization. Um, Symptoms usually appear between two to 14 days after exposure to SARS-CoV-2, which is just the fancy term for COVID-19. And there are a bunch of symptoms, okay? I have them listed there. It's, they're pretty like, meh, we're not really sure. So I've been recommending that parents be uh, monitoring their children for signs of infection daily, especially before they're going to dance classes. Um, and then there's also limited data that children do have as higher risk. Um, as adults do. And if they do get sick, it's usually much um, less serious of an illness. But we have seen these multi system inflammatory syndromes in children, especially here in New York. And so, it, it, you know, it's not without risk. So, I, we still want kids to be careful. And you have to be careful that your kids aren't spreading it to uh, older adults. Um, mask use is an important um, thing to talk about, I think. And so, uh, I think it's important to keep a spare mask in your dance bag. And I really do think people should be wearing masks when they're dancing. And I know that sounds awful, but listen to this. Coughs travel about eight feet when you cough. So your respiratory droplets when you cough travel eight feet. When you yell or sing, i.e. like when a dance teacher is keeping time and yelling out instructions to you, that can travel 10 feet. That is really far, okay? Respiratory droplets are much more likely to transmit, um, to share COVID with someone else than contact with objects or surfaces. So if somebody with COVID touched my chair and then I touched my chair, the odds of me getting COVID from that are pretty low, we found. But if I walked into someone else's cough, 
actually pretty high risk, okay? So current evidence, COVID can remain viable for hours to days on different surfaces, but we don't know how long it stays inside the air of a room that somebody with COVID has been in, okay? So should you wear um, an N95 mask? So that's the fancy mask that you saw all of the medical providers wearing, okay? This is an N95 mask right here. It's got a little valve on the end of it. And the answer for you is no. But the question is why? If I wear it, why shouldn't you wear it? So the idea behind this mask is it is supposed to um, um, filter out 95% of the particles that come from the outside air that comes into my mouth, okay? If it's filtering those particles, it is to protect me from people who I know have COVID. It does not protect those COVID people from me because they already have it. This valve, when I blow out of it, does not filter the air on the way out. So if I cough in here and I have COVID, I've just spread it out just like before, okay? So this filter helps me on the way in. It doesn't help others on the way out. And so any mask with a valve, unfiltered air is being blown out. So remember, you wear your mask to protect others. So if I'm wearing this to protect you, I'm not being very helpful. If I'm wearing something more like this to protect you, that's more helpful. There's no valve there. And all of these types of masks, okay? These two or three layered uh, fabric masks are actually the best masks that we um, have found for um, use because a study was done at Florida Atlantic University. I talk about this in the, in the Dan Doctors for Dancers thing, but these masks, um, if they're triple layer quilted ones, they actually, if you cough in there, uh, your respiratory droplets only travel 2.5 inches. So that's the least amount of travel out of all the different kinds of masks. Whereas a bandana tied around my neck or tied around my head like this, um, that if I cough still travels three feet. So that's a massive difference between those two. If you find that um, masks are really difficult for you to use, you can use a face shield to dance. Um, but it should cover your entire face and it's still not quite as, as safe. So that um, that study I just told you about, it, this is the link for it, so you can totally check it out on your own, okay? This thing is also a good idea. So if you just don't like masks, but you don't want to wear a face shield either, this thing is called a bracket. It's apparently a lipstick protector. I bought some to test them out, okay? Um, they go inside the mask like this, okay? And then they go on your face. And it stops, when I breathe in really hard, it won't let the fabric penetrate into my mouth, which is a big issue because most people complain that when they breathe too hard, the fabric goes in their mouth, which tastes disgusting. So I actually did a study, a little personal practice run. So on my Instagram, if you go to Columbia Dance Medicine on Instagram, you can see me skipping. So I did a skipping study with one of these brackets on and tested my pulse oxygenation. So how much um, uh, oxygen was in my blood and it showed that my oxygenation did not go down at all. That thing stayed in my mask, no problem. And so this might be a good option for people that are having trouble where finding a mask that fits their face well enough. But really, any mask that kind of maintains this shape is probably better. The other types of masks that sometimes are good for that is the duckbill shaped masks. So you look like Daffy Duck, but um, they're pretty helpful. This one happens to be an N95, but there's fabric versions of these. Okay. Um, the media is very annoying right now. I'm not going to lie to you. So JAMA is the Journal of American Medical Association, wrote an essay saying that there's a lot of unreliability and scientific inaccuracies of recent news reports about COVID medical research. That's why you're getting all this different information from all these different perspectives and you can't tell what's real and what's not. The problem is there's been a failure of science communication. And the reason for that is because we're listening to the wrong people and we're letting the media sensationalize research as it's happening. You are seeing real live research happening in real time. This is what happens. We make a hypothesis, we test it out, we realize we were wrong, we change things, we learn from it, we make a new hypothesis, test it out, okay? But instead what we're seeing is they look at a single study that's been done, no context to other studies, no acknowledgement that it's you know only a single study, and so they use it as God's word, and that's not how it works. They overemphasize results, 
especially relative effects without recognizing the important limitations. We're not seeing peer reviewed articles, which are important. You need to look at the experts in the field to say, does this make sense? Because sometimes you can miss something. Um, so try to see past the media, look on reasonable websites. Trump is not a good source for medical knowledge. So please, I don't care if you follow him politically, but don't listen to him from a public health perspective. The CDC is great, okay? Fauci is great, okay? A lot of these, most other doctors are great, okay? We, scientists, for the most part, we know what we're talking about, but there are the odd few that have a political agenda that they're just pushing it one way or the other. CNN, Fox News, all of these people, their goal is not to be outright with you in terms of true science. Their goal is to sensationalize the media so that you tune in for them, okay? This is just a really quick little um, study that was done that looked at symptom duration and risk factor for delayed return. So a lot of people said early on, why don't I just get sick and get it over with? Well, number one, because we don't know if having antibodies guarantees you won't get sick again. And number two, we don't really know what happens after you get COVID. Your recovery can take a long time. And there's a lot of people that actually have ongoing issues down the road. So two to three weeks after testing, uh, a lot of people hadn't returned to their natural state of health. And one in five people ages 18 to 34, young people with no chronic medical conditions uh, had not returned to their usual state of health. That's a problem, okay? So we can get prolonged illnesses. We can see weird cardiac heart issues um, in some of these people. And so there's a lot of them that we won't necessarily want going back to sport until they get a full medical evaluation again, including a heart test because there's a risk of myocarditis that we've noticed, okay? So things like that. So it's not just the flu. So my main recommendations regarding COVID, okay? Wash your freaking hands. I can't say that more than anything. I don't know why we have to tell people to wash their hands because I feel like it's obvious, but wash your hands, please, okay? Masks are important. They are necessary. I also think teachers should be wearing masks in the studio, okay? So if you need to yell and your dancers can't hear you, consider buying a microphone like the Britney Spears one from like early 2000s that can go under your mask and you can talk through that or wear a face shield at least with the microphone, okay? So one of those two things. Um, somebody once asked me about barefoot, bare feet versus socks versus shoes. It doesn't really matter. We aren't finding COVID is transmitted through sweat and your feet aren't really touching your face. That's pretty impressive if they are. Um, and so you should be okay from that. So if you're staying in like kind of a little dance bubble of about 10 feet, you should be fine. Um, this little thing is a pulse oximeter. I have another one here just to show you what it looks like. It goes on your finger like this, tells you how much you're oxygenating, okay? As long as you're above 92, you're probably good. It also will tell you your heart rate. So this isn't a bad idea to have in the dance studios. Purell, okay? If you cannot wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer should have at least 60% isopropyl alcohol in it. Purell has 70%. I prefer above 70%, okay? Germax is 62. Purell is 70. I don't make any money off either of the companies. I don't care which one you use, but I think you should use Purell if you can. All right? And then um, cleaning, screening, you know, do your best in terms of distancing. I think there should be about 10 feet between dancers, so marking the floor is important. I don't think partner work is a good idea right now. I think we, you know, you can mark things out, but I don't, that's too much touching. That's so much touching. Just don't do it right now. So, and then just proceed with caution, maybe have some protocols for screening. So have parents checking their kids ahead of time, maybe check temperatures with one of those temp guns on the way into the studios. Any of those things are possible. Um, in terms of take home points, so again, more than 16 hours a week of intense training in anything, in any kind of sport, is great risk. Okay, so children who participate in more than that um, uh, can, can be at risk for burnout, overuse, injury, and potential decrements or decreasing in your performance because of uh, overtraining. Okay, monitor for indicators of burnout, overuse, or uh, overtraining. Uh, periodize strength and conditioning to help diversify your motor skills. So basically, 
if you work on different neuromuscular um, training to help um, your motor skills overall, that's going to make you a stronger dancer in the long run, okay? Some of the best athletes were multi-sport athletes. And the reason they're the best athletes is because they got diverse motor skills from all those separate sports. If you focus too much onto one skill, then a lot of times you will be imbalanced and that puts you at higher risk for injury. Education is important. Identify inaccurate information about the injury rehab process to reduce the emotional stress it takes on you, okay? When you don't know the answer to what's wrong with you, it is more stressful than at least knowing the answer. We need more healthcare providers who understand dance so that there's less reluctance to seek care. And then be your own champion. So don't be afraid to ask about COVID policies and protection everywhere you go. Dance companies should be having COVID policies in place for us to go back to dance safely, okay? And if you're a professional dancer, you should be asking whoever's hiring you, what, what do you have for me? What are my options? If I'm not getting masks well, and I'm doing partner work, are you testing us for COVID first? Are you isolating us from everyone else? What's happening there? Be a champion. You deserve the right to know this stuff because it's your health we're talking about. There's a bunch of resources. Doctors for Dancers is a great one. We have a bunch of webinars and dance health science research and specialists. International Association for Dance Medicine and Science has great information on it. Performing Arts Medicine Association is also wonderful. I'm a member of both of those. And then the CDC in terms of COVID-related issues. Thank you. I love this quote from Martha. So great dancers are not great because of their technique. They're great because of their passion. But I have a caveat to it. They stay healthy because of their technique. Take care of your bodies. You only have one of them, okay? Questions, please let me know. That's my email address if you have questions. Um, that's my Instagram. And then Twitter is at the new Dr. J. Thank you. Can you so much. say the last two? The last two what? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, is it possible to repeat the last two resources? You missed them. Oh, yeah. So the Center for Disease Control is one of them. And then um, PAMA, so Performing Arts Medical Association. Here, let me share my screen again just to show you. Right, down here. There you go. So Performing Arts Medical Association, right there. Oops, come back here. There you go. Performing Arts Medical Association and then IADAMS. So this is a, a big dance medicine and science. Uh, there's a lot of great journal articles. There's a lot of research that goes uh, in both of these organizations here. Is that good? Thank you. You are so welcome. I have to say that First, thank you. That presentation was fantastic. And um, it just falls in line with everything we've been talking about all week. And it has the, you know, actual science to back up uh, equity and inclusivity, uh, which is fantastic <laughs> in such a way. Um, are, are you open? Can we open up for any specific? Absolutely. Questions? I'm here in my office. You have me as long as you need me. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions uh, reg regarding their studio or their student or themselves? At any point, if you ask a vulnerable question and you would not like to be recorded, please just let me know and I will stop the recording. I also want to make a point that we are learning at the same time as you guys, okay? I get the information sooner, sure, but this is this is not something I've ever had to deal with before. And so a lot of the recommendations I'm making right now are based on what we know right now. Will that change in two months? Maybe. Okay. And if it does, I promise you it will be on those that Doctors for Dancer website. It'll be on the CDC. Okay. But that is where I guarantee you can get a hold of us for questions. And if you think of a question down the road or you just don't want to ask it in front of all of them, send me a message on Instagram privately. I am happy, I'll, I can't guarantee I'll get to it in 24 hours, but I, I will get to it, I promise you. And I'm happy to answer questions as best as I can. Kristen. Kristen. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. I've got a question. So we are, in, we are located in Indiana and our governor has put out a mask mandate for our state. And in that mandate, it is for um, everyone eight years and older to wear a mask while in public, while in businesses, 
et cetera. We service a lot of young dancers at our studio and we're getting ready to um, start our fall session in late August. So we've got time to like think through best policies and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I want to know for, for young dancers, like I'm talking two and a half, six, seven, like what are your recommendations for that, for making sure we're keeping them safe? That's a great question. So, so it's tough because with, with kids that young, it's hard to get them to do anything all the time. Uh, never mind do it with this thing on their face, right? So one thing that we could recommend is um, you could put out a policy that you have all parents sign that say, we're going to try our best to have kids wearing masks. Um, maybe try training your child at home to practice dancing in a mask, just to make it feel normal to them, okay? Um, if they're two or three years old, chances are they have fairly low exposure from the outside world because they're probably not interacting with a ton of other people. So they might be fine. Or we might want to try just wearing shields for them. That way you, they can see, you know, you can see their full face. It kind of looks like a little hat. They might like it more. Um, so finding ways to make them fun. Otherwise, finding masks that are fun colors. Like this is pretty boring looking mask. None of my masks are all that cool looking. But if it had like Elsa or somebody on it, maybe that would make it more interesting for them or more fun for them. Um, and so I think if people, um, one of the other doctors that's on our panel for this Doctors for Dancers, she has two young kids and they've been training them to wear masks. So they wear it for an hour a day, then two hours a day, and they try doing exercises with it. Um, and that can be helpful. Um, but I think if nothing else, the face shield might be good. Um, I would say maybe five and up, I would for sure want them wearing masks. I think eight's a little of an odd random number to choose. <laughs> like eight-year-olds are pretty smart. I feel like they get it. So I think five and up's probably good. But again, young children are less likely, we think, less likely to share the, the, um, the illness. So really good hand hygiene for them big time, like make it super fun to wash your hands um, and then lots of Purell and they should all be bringing their own individual water. They shouldn't be sitting in groups, things like that. And if you're keeping them distanced from each other in the studio, you're probably okay. Hi, um, my name is Luella Bangra. Uh, I'm also in Lafayette, Indiana. I'm a physician here. I just want to say a comment. Thank you so much for giving this presentation. It's very informative. What I liked about your presentation is that you mentioned about more preventative stuff, and you kind of uh, touched on some homeopathic uh, information. The preventative stuff is really going to help us as fall comes in, uh, especially with flu season yep. coming in. Um, immunizations is, uh, is very key, whether you're a dancer or any type of person. And a lot of our young people are, aren't really up on their immunizations, um, yeah. especially the flu. Tetanus is very key for dancers. You have injuries or if you have to have a surgery, you would have to have those immunizations. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned is the nutrition. I think you were touched on that. The nutrition, when you were talking about vitamin D, D3 is the one that they actually are finding out. The people who do get COVID, there is some research, the people who do get COVID, the side effects are less. Yes, it doesn't prevent COVID, but the history that they're seeing and this is what they're seeing is that the symptoms, the risk of ending up to a point where you need a ventilator is less. Right. So vitamin so, D3, and you kind of touched on it. Also, the vitamin C is a good option. The quercetin, which is in onions, you can get that from onions, apples, berries that you might mention. All that combination is what we're finding out now and the research is saying. It's not preventative, it's, but it reduces the risk. And as a dancer, somebody that's out there and their nutrition is kind of plus minus, <laughs> um, the green vegetables are key. Yeah. That you could, and, and I know uh, it's expensive for some foods or they get certain herbals and vitamins, but sometimes just simple things. 
simple things in your diet can can get you where you need to go and keep you healthy, that's the big thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I totally agree. So a lot of this is like I made a point in all of those vitamins and nutrients that I mentioned, there are food ways to get it. Okay. It's way more expensive to take it from a pill. So if you, right. if you like cucumbers, eat the darn cucumbers, <laughs> like let, right. it, let it in there. Um, right. And yes, the vitamin D3 thing. Yeah, you're right. So, so it's just, it's a question of like, what's too much, what's too little. Um, and so I think that getting labs to know what your baseline is for a lot of these, right. is very important. it's very important. Cause very otherwise, important. otherwise a lot of these things, you're going to take that supplement and you're just going to pee it out. Right. I found out recently that my vitamin D level, and I'm a physician, was nine. It was just nine, a single digit. Yeah. Now you're supposed to be somewhere in the 30s. Yeah. And what that did, this is another thing that people don't talk about with vitamin D. Vitamin D, they talk about your bones and your muscles, but your thought process, Yeah, you your memory, mm -hmm. you know, and it puts your higher risk to like mental problems and also depression. Mm -hmm. And like suicide, you yeah. know, with all the stress that dancers go through, these are the things that, you know, just simple eating the right foods can, can make things a little bit less stressful yeah. and get you into the, the idea of how to tolerate some of the, the stress of the environment right? and yes. the stress of the work. And, and we have a question in you. the group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Lou. I, uh, Dr. J, I got really sick on a job one time and um, Lou oh. is one of the parents of, of one of our Liberate Artist Dance Captains and she oh, like, cool. I got really, really sick um, last November. Um, so Joanne asked, I may have missed it, but was the topic of fresh air and air conditioning discussed in regard Ooh. to spreading the virus? Yeah, so we, we talked about this in this Doctors for Dancers thing, which is why I didn't talk about it today. I, I would love you guys to go watch the video. It's, I think it's great. And we'll, we're going to talk about it even more next, uh, next time. We're going to talk more about pr um, uh, protocols for if somebody is sick, screening processes, all of that kind of stuff. But the air conditioning thing is, is tricky. So. Um, Fresh air is better. Outside is better, obviously. Uh, if you can open windows, open doors, that's good. What we don't think is good is something like an enclosed space and then just fans running. Because if you have everyone socially distanced, but then you have a fan blowing the air from over here to over here, and it's not escaping anywhere, then you're just blowing all those germs around into a little tornado. With air conditioners, it's a little bit more tricky because if you have central air, then it should be conditioning uh, or sending air in, exhaust comes out, takes it out, and puts new air through. But those bar conditioners that you might see at some restaurants, like the ones that just come across the bar and they just like shoot straight out and then come back and shoot straight out, they're not necessarily um, filtering the air all that well. They might just kind of be recycling it and cooling it. And if that's the case, then again, you're just kind of spreading those germs. So there was a research study um, I want them in Japan, but they looked at a restaurant and they had, you know, tables in rows behind air conditioners and somebody with COVID was sitting near an air conditioner and everybody in that row of that air conditioner's range got sick. Whereas the other rows that were in other air conditioners range, nobody got sick there. So I'm, I'm over exaggerating here and I'm oversimplifying, but, but those, those long air conditioners, we're still not really sure what to do about those. You know, we obviously, if you're in Arizona, 110 is not good dancing weather, right? So you got to do something. Um, and so the risk is probably okay if everyone's wearing a mask, but still, if you can manage not to, or if you can get some doors and windows open instead, that's probably better. I hope that helps and didn't confuse you more. And Shannon just shared it, Dr. J, and then we'll also share it in our after notes. Um, Doctors for Dancers, the work they are doing is exceptional and it's so crucial and a missing portion of what we need as educators to ensure that safety is the priority in dance education. Um, so I, this presentation was so, so, informative and in a way that was actionable. And I think 
all of us here are, what can we do to prevent and to prepare for the new world that we're living in? Right, exactly. It truly is a brave new world. It's weird. The, all these dystopian novels you used to read in like high school and college, you're like, well, this might be coming true now. Uh, so <laughs> we have to be smart about this because because I know I know people are stressed and I know that this can feel overwhelming and stress doesn't help you, right? Trust me, <laughs> I know this for a fact. So, so if you can find a couple key things that you do to make things safer and you get that right sleep and you make sure that everyone is feeling, you know, taken care of and happy and healthy, that's going to help you immensely, okay? If you don't have every single thing perfectly laid out, that's probably okay, all right? What I also think that people should be doing, and this is going to be very studio dependent, but I think that people should have parents sign a consent that says, if my child gets sick, I agree to share that information with the studio so the studio can let anybody else in that kid's dance class know to go get tested. They don't have to say who the kid is, but they should be saying, somebody in the class got ill, we recommend everyone try to go get tested. And the kid who got sick needs to be in quarantine for 14 days. Okay, and then they have to have no symptoms for 72 hours, sorry, Christine. I was just gonna comment on that actually, cause we were, we've been working on, you know, our waiver, our liability form, and obviously making like a COVID addendum to that. Yeah. But we were worried about, and we weren't really sure who to reach out to legality wise. Like, yeah, are they obligated to share that or do we need to seek that information out? And I guess right. we can put that caveat in there. So, so twofold. So you are not in violation of HIPAA laws if you share that information. You are not, under, I am, right? But you are not. You are not, you're not a healthcare provider, so you don't need to worry about HIPAA, okay? So that's important to know, because so nobody can sue you for sharing that information, okay? Now, um, what we have talked about is maybe consider having a doctor that you either work closely with or that you know, or even having one of the doctors for dancers, physicians do it, is to try to figure out, you know, kind of a, a, a plan or a protocol or a general outline of how your studio is going to work, how it's going to open. And you simply say, hey, parents, it's this or no. That's, that's all it can be. You can say, if your kid still wants to dance with us, but you don't want to follow these rules, then you can do Zoom classes. And that's fine. That's what this year is for you then. You work on your neuromuscular training instead of competing. Because nobody's probably competing this year, let's be serious. It's mostly just, a, it's an off year. It's a, it's a year to work on technique. It's a year to work on um neuromuscular control it's a year to work on balance and strength and cross training and all of those things to make you stronger dancers overall but it is not the year that you're going to be identified for dancing with the stars or uh you know you're not going to be the next misty copeland this year because nobody's gonna yeah see it, you know i gotta say something yeah you're correct i do physicals for mma fighters here in indiana mm -hmm. and the rule is for the uh indiana gaming commission if you don't get an HIV test, you don't get a hepatitis test, and your blood drawn, you cannot go into the ring. Yeah. You just can't. It doesn't matter what you say. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And you could you could consider having a lawyer look over your policy too, just to make sure that there's not an issue with um, with the verbiage. Just the lawyer shouldn't be making the policy because they have no knowledge of medical necessity. And Lou, I just wanted to mention to you, I did my intern year in Indiana. I was at uh, St. Vincent Hospital in Indianapolis. So I love Indy. <laughs> Great. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know uh, if you do need to run, um, you can take our hip hop class. I put that chat in the link. And Dana Lopez, you have a question? I just unmuted you. Um, yes. If one of the students, um, or we're told that one of the students did have COVID, does that mean everyone that was in the class should quarantine for 14 days? So not necessarily. If any of them have symptoms, yes, absolutely. What I would say, like I said, is you send out kind of a telephone tree and say, somebody in the class is sick. Mm -hmm. We would like everyone to go get tested if they can. Um, if they're having any symptoms, obviously you should stay home. And um, if anyone was in close contact with that person, 
you might want them to kind of stay out of class for, you know, seven days to see if they get any symptoms. Okay. Okay. That's what the NCAA is doing with a lot of our football teams and stuff like that too. So. Okay. Thank you. You got it. And we have another question in here from the chat from Marissa and Margarita. Did I say your name correctly? Because I've been calling you Margie this whole time. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. But do you suggest that kids not compete this upcoming season? And if they do decide to compete, what precautions should be taken? Oh, that's such a loaded question, guys. Um, <laughs> okay, so it depends on where the competition is. It depends on if it's in a state that is getting its but handed to it like Florida is right now, I would not recommend anyone go to Florida right now. So once we get a vaccine, hopefully this will be, you know, water under the bridge to some extent, but competitions are going to be tough. Partner dancing is not a good idea. Transitions is probably not a good idea, right? It's going to be very hard to get much in terms of competition unless you're doing solo competitions. Those might be okay. But I honest to God think that everyone who's competing is going to have to be completely segregated and literally go on stage, do their dance, put their mask back on and leave and stay the heck away. And then they should have the award ceremony via Zoom, which is very sad. But that's what I think it should be. Um, until we actually have a vaccination and until we can feel like we can actually safely take care of everyone, unless things change, that's probably the recommendation. I would be shocked if a lot of places do competitions this year. I really would. I just, I don't think it's smart. I don't think it's worth it. Um, I think you're going to end, because then if anything, even if the kids get to dance, we wouldn't let the parents in there. So you're going to be dancing to an empty crowd. It'll be like the NBA where they're playing basketball and nobody's watching except for nobody's videotaping you. So you'd have to watch it on Zoom. And it's just, it loses something. So if you're going to compete that way, then you might as well just have a Zoom competition completely and everyone just Zoom in their dance competition piece and then the judges you know decide on zoom it makes me sad to say i'm sorry but that's that's honestly what i think would be would be safer or a better idea if people really do want to do a competition you're welcome are there any other questions uh, from any participant, I'm scrolling to see if there's a hand up. I can unmute you, or if anything pops up in the chat, please let us know. Um, and again, these uh, resources will be going out. We, you know, this will be available. And um, Dr. J, you said that the slides would also be available for participants. Yeah, I'll send. I can send you guys a copy of them, um, and I'm fine with you disseminating it out. Just, um, I would because the ones I gave Jerry aren't finished. I was just giving her an outline. So I'll give you the new version of it. But the only, it <laughs> the, only thing, the only thing I ask is if you do keep these, if you do share these resources, you have to make sure that you say these are from Dr. Aya Frady and they're her personal opinion, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Absolutely. so this isn't, so, you know, don't, don't try to steal my slides, I guess is my oh, name. We don't, don't pretend you're me. That's all. We so won't. Otherwise, it's fine. <laughs> follow you on Instagram, too. Your Instagram account is so awesome. Oh, thank yes. you. Yeah, thank so you. Helpful. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think, Shannon? Yeah, I dropped the link in a couple of times. It's at Columbia Dance Medicine um, yeah. at Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, oh, sorry, I sent it privately. Let me send that publicly. Um, I've been sharing a lot of links this whole time. Don't worry if you don't um, copy them down from the chat. I have also been taking notes. Um, so thank you so, so much uh, for all of these different resources. The ones I have are from the slides as well, as well as all of your personal um, uh, kind of social media and then the Doctors for Dancers stuff on YouTube. Yeah, we're, we're doing our best for you guys. And we honestly, any new information we get, I. I promise I will try to share whether it's on, you know, my Instagram or on Doctors for Dancers or something. We'll, we'll get it out to you somehow for sure. I mean, it is extraordinary. You were talking about access that you are pushing boundaries and breaking down those barriers to make sure that dancers do have access because I know it can be a really harrowing time to try and find the right information. So thank oh, you yeah. for making it available to all of us. And that you is, are welcome. It is a gift for all of our lives and and happy to do it. Folks. Happy to do it. I, I underwent three knee surgeries in college 
because I just felt so mismanaged and, um, you know, my dance career kind of went out the window at that point. So I'm trying to take care of the people so that it doesn't happen to them because it was very frustrating for me. I mean, I, I, to share this story, I sustained an injury in a dance class in college because of mismanagement and was diagnosed with spondylolisthesis and now have oh. compression in my thoracic spine because of it. So Good. yeah, you, yeah, it's delicious, <laughs> <Super>. <laughs> um, but um, it is so life-saving what you are doing and thank you. No problem. Happy to do it. And I'm, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. Uh, good. Okay. Good. Yes. Um, and again, our, it's six o'clock right now. Um, if folks do have questions, please, like, you know, Dr. J, if you're willing to stick around for a couple more minutes, we can yep. keep the chat open. We can keep this chat going. Um, and if you have to boogie out, uh, Comfort Fidoki's hip hop class is in the creator's room. So I'm going to drop that link one more time. Um, but Who doesn't love comfort? Oh, right. <laughs> I wish I was taking it <laughs> in my scrub. I would do it. I don't care. <laughs> yes. Hey, dance is for everyone. Dance is for everyone. <laughs> um, we're getting comments. Thank you so much. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Oh, um, thanks, guys. Information's extremely helpful. So we're we're very grateful for that. Yeah. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, you uh, just want to confirm before I say it again. You said it's okay for folks to reach out to you on Instagram. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, and that's at Columbia Dance Medicine. Doesn't look like there's anything else, so um, I'll go ahead. Oh, Nikki, Nikki. No, Nikki, lies, lies and slander. <laughs> I'm sorry. I uh, just unmuted you, Nikki. What's up? Thank you. Hi. Sorry, I was like, mm, I'm waiting, <laughs> but I don't want to interrupt things either. Um, I just kind of, um, it's not really a quick question. It's more touching on the, the mental health coping strategies. Can you do a little bit, talk a little bit more about those things? Because um, I think that um you have specific insight when it comes to you know how can dances handle things for the situation that they're in right now and that kind of thing so i would love to hear more about that yeah i think i think the biggest issue is um a lot of people's identity is tied to dance a lot of dancers identity is tied to dance i should say right it's a big part of who you are and so when that part got shut down a lot of people had a hard time finding something to fill that void and I think it's similar to when you get injured. So if you sustain an injury and you're out of dance, I think part of the reason people don't tell their instructors or tell their doctors that they're hurt is because they don't want to stop because you lose a piece of yourself when you have to stop. I think number one, being open enough with yourself to register that is important. And then from there, it's, it's finding people that you can talk to um, whether it be friends, family, um, uh, counselor, whatever, but about like, this is how I'm feeling with this situation right now. And being able to register that this is not forever. It feels like forever. Back in March, we thought by July, we'd all be dancing and everything would be normal again. Right. And so it's this, like keep, things keep get putting, getting pushed back and back and back. And I think that's what's become so frustrating for a lot of people. It's like, oh my God, when will it be over? And people feel um, kind of bombarded with, like I said, all this social media and all this media exploding out everywhere that makes some things sound way worse than they are and makes other things sound way better than they are. And you're stuck in the middle going, which one's right? Um, um, there is a gentleman named Terry Hyde. So he is on our Doctors for Dancers panel. He is a counselor from the UK, um, an ex-dancer himself. And he, um, he's got some really interesting resources that he um, likes to share. And he does, um, he does like a lot of one-on-one -on -one communication via Zoom or whatever, just to say like, what, what is it that you're actually feeling that you're missing? Is it the camaraderie part of it? Is it the technique part of it? Is it, um, is it just getting the heck out of your house part of it? Like, what is it that feels like it's missing? Um, and then he's, he's been good at helping people register that. I think finding good sleep patterns is important. I think um, finding things that make you happy otherwise are important this is kind of one of those times that instead of looking at it as I can't dance right now look at it as I have a chance to learn something new now you know so find some other skill that you want to learn take up crocheting I don't care 
or try like some people were like I learned a whole new language and I was like that's great I was in the ICU working so <laughs> um, I wish I was learning new languages but finding something else that can take that creative need that you have and put it into something else because right now that dance creative need is not being filled and so I think for a lot of people it's it's finding a place to redirect it for now um, that can make a big difference and so yeah so Terry Hyde his his Instagram if you want to look at his yeah. is counseling for dancers but it's c-o-u-n-c-i-l-l -L. it's like the UK spelling right so Nikki you sound like you're maybe from in that area I don't know Africa originally. Africa? Okay. So I was like, you're definitely not from, yeah. I was like, I heard an accent. I couldn't tell what it was because of Zoom, but. Um, been for 23 years, but I'm originally from South Africa. Yeah. There you go. So I'm originally Canadian, I'm Italian, but I'm Canadian and we also spell it with two L's. So I'm like, anybody who's not American gets that it's two L's. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with you guys, but whatever. Sorry. So it's counseling we, with two L's. We mess up a lot. Is it uh, <laughs> counseling for dancer, C-O-U-N-C-I-L-L? I yeah. G for dancers. I just dropped that link in the Instagram. Yeah. And his name is Terry Hyde. Fantastic. So the reason I was asking that question was more, um, more just to have information and knowledge because I, I have been one of those people. Um, I'm, I've had lung issues in the past. So I've actually been like self quarantined and not seeing anybody. I don't go out at all since yeah. March. For me, yeah. I had to deal with that like really very far at the beginning, but I, I wanted to be able to have additional resources for anybody that I work with or gotcha. and then so that kind of follows another question would be um, how how could we like me for example I don't have a studio I am an like, independent um, coach basically so how how can I be more um, of service let's say or like what kind of words or you know, if I see possibly somebody who's struggling with something or is really missing dancing, is not handling it so well, like, how can I approach being, a, like, you know, support for that person or um, encouragement or something like that? Like, what kind of, you know, what kind of words to use or, like, you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, that yeah. kind of... I think, I think, honestly, just being able to listen to people is sometimes really important because a lot of these people that are socially isolated feel like they're just talking to themselves. Like, I feel like everyone needs a Wilson ball from like Castaway kind of thing. Cause you're like, who do I talk to anymore? So, so just being a set of ears sometimes is really important and saying, I understand, I, I feel what you're saying and I'm here with you, you know? Um, there's also beyond the U S organization. So the, the, PAMA and the Doctors for Dancers and I Adams and stuff. There's also the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine. It's uh, BAPAM, I guess, British, yeah, British Association for Performing Arts Medicine. And then One Dance UK that also has a lot of stuff. And then um, I think being able to have people saying, I understand that you feel like you lost control over this situation and that's okay. And that it's okay to acknowledge the fear of we don't know what's coming next. We don't know where we are in this current situation. We thought we'd be further along, but there's other people that thought we'd be exploded by now. So, you know, we're doing okay. Um, so I think just, just being open, being able to hear people and um, um, talking to them about, okay, well, if you're feeling like you're missing out on dance, what's something else that you have? Uh, either a passion about learning about or what's another creative outlet you think you might be interested in and trying to get them to redirect that creative juice somewhere else might also help kind of alleviate some of that stress for them and like so I mean socially distanced walks are fine like you can walk beside each other just kind of far apart from each other with your masks on or you can dance outside apart from each other but with a mask on if you can find a mask that fits your face well it really does not impede you very much. I, honest to God, skipped for 10 minutes with a mask on and like I got sweaty, but I breathed fine, you know? And so being able to realize that, whereas if I were to wear this mask, you know, if I breathe hard, 
it went in my mouth and it tastes terrible and it gets wet and it's hard. It's, it feels suffocating. And I think that's also anxiety provoking. I think mask anxiety is a real thing. And so people don't want to try dancing because they don't want to wear a mask because they're anxious about it. But if you can decrease that anxiety, it might make it a lot easier to transition. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Amazing. Are there any other questions? I want to make sure everything gets answered. And also, I, I, we're so grateful, Dr. J, that you were able to do this today. And no problem. We're so generous to stay over. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. It's fine with me. Cool. I was like, uh, I finished my last patient and I was like, okay, I'm locking my office door. Nobody come in here. Don't bother me. So, no problem. Cool. Um, any other questions from anyone else? Awesome. I don't see any hands or any like um, questions coming in in the chat. Uh, Jerry is, uh, I see snapping fingers. <laughs> um, uh, Jerry, sorry, she had to run over to uh, Comfort's hip hop class. If you would like to take that, Dr. J, and your office is still closed, be like, the meeting ran over. The link's I in the chat. <laughs> yeah, you totally <laughs> can. <I> um, <laughs> um, and for any of our educators and our creators, obviously, that link is in the chat. Um, no passwords or anything. I'll drop it again one more time. But we cannot thank you enough uh, for for being so generous today and sharing all of these resources. I've taken some notes. Uh, the slides will be going out, so just keep an eye out for that in the educators. Um, if you're a parent, that that will come in a separate uh, form. But if you're an educator, this is all coming in your educator actionable steps packet that will be sent out in the next two weeks. Uh, any final thoughts to wrap up? I, I hope you guys do well with things. I hope it doesn't feel too overwhelming. Um, we're definitely here from, for you if you need us, but I, I think you're all doing the right thing just by educating yourself. Like you being here is the right thing to do because you're learning information, um, you're trying to educate yourself and you're not letting you know the media craze that's happening you know, dictate how you, how you reopen. So thank you for being cautious and being smart and doing right by your dancers. Yes. And thank you so much for sharing that. You know, we, we have talked a lot about actionable steps and I know that can feel like a very nebulous concept. Um, but like you said, Dr. J, being here is an actionable step. So <laughs> yes, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we so appreciate your time and thank you again for being here. Yes, snaps. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope that uh, for the folks that are in this room that you will join us either for some of the classes this afternoon or for the You Are Enough closing ceremonies from 8 to 9 tonight in the Creators Room, 8 to 9 Eastern Standard Time. So uh, I'm not 100% sure, depending on where your time zone, what time that will be. Um, but it's just going to be uh, in three hours. And we have some really exciting scholarships that we're giving out um, and some really amazing things that we can discuss uh, tonight. I don't want to give too much away. Uh, so I will see you then. Uh, I will leave this room open, but it'll just be a graphic directing you over to the creator's room. This room, we are signing out for the whole conference. So thank you, everyone. We will see Thanks, you tonight. Guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.